Thank you all for joining Dr. Brown's Medical Educational Webinar Series provided by the Medical Division of Handicraft Company. Today we are honored to present Dr. Erin Sunset Ross, who received her master's degree in speech and language pathology from California State University Stanislaus and received her doctoral degree in clinical sciences health services research from the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center in 2007. Dr. Ross completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship in the School of Medicine, Department of Pediatrics in the Section of Nutrition at the University of Colorado Denver. She has specialized clinically in the development of feeding skills, the etiology and treatment of feeding and growth problems in infants and very young children through five years of age. Dr. Ross's research interests are focused on understanding normal feeding and growth and on identifying and treating infants and young children who are not developing typically in these areas. She is certified in NIDCAP and in the APIB assessments. Before we start the presentation, I'd like to explain how this series will work. In preparing for this presentation, Dr. Ross has offered us an opportunity to support a three-part series. Part three today will describe specific infant behaviors observed during oral feeding that guide infant-led oral feeding interventions that can guide clinical decisions to support positive short and long-term feeding outcomes. Dr. Ross has kindly offered her reference list for her presentation, which will be posted on the Dr. Brown's medical website, along with the presentation within the next few weeks. Part one and two are already available for your view on the website. Dr. Ross has graciously offered to answer your questions throughout this report series in a recorded Q&A session. The session will be posted on the website following this series, this lecture series. Now we'll begin. Dr. Ross will be presenting from task-oriented to infant-led feeding, State of the Science, Part 3. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you, Sandy. I'm excited to uh, be presenting this third part in the three-part series. Um, as Sandy has mentioned, these are the objectives for this third part of the series. And if you recall, um, this is the beginning part of this uh, third um, section is similar to the beginning part of the first two sections. I recognize that not everyone will have attended the first two parts of this three-part lecture series, so these are my disclosures. And as always, I wanted to remind everyone to please uh, do not reproduce in any form any of the pictures that I have in this presentation. They've been given to me uh, by patients that I have worked with uh, for the most part. I also wanted to again um, uh, thank the researchers and the scientists who have been providing information for us so that we can improve our practice. That's really the goal of this three-part series is to help us all sit back and take time to reflect. And I wanted to thank Handicraft for providing this forum. I also wanted to acknowledge and thank all of all of us who are clinical based, um, both clinician and research based uh, practitioners are really trying to help move the science forward. So once again, just to try and bring us all onto the same page, there are a couple of different ways of thinking about infant feeding and certainly one of the ways of thinking about infant feeding is going to be thinking about providing food, but we're looking at the much broader context of nourishing, so fostering the development of feeding in this particular case. We've spent the first two lecture parts looking at perspectives related to infant feeding and what the state of the science is, uh, really kind of focusing on where have we come from. So this third part is really trying to bring things together, thinking about where are we now, where are we going, and how do we get there, so that each of us can start to make those kinds of decisions for ourselves. As always, everything that we do in relationship to supporting infant feeding needs to be done in the context of understanding what expectations we should have. And so the Von Na Nostrand article is a wonderful resource that I uh, like to give people. Um, also, uh, Reader Pickler's article in 2015, which really points out that regardless of starting infants sooner or later in the process, uh, and regardless of how we progress, there's really not been a change in 
postmenstrual age of full oral feedings or in uh, discharge or length of stay. And so let's start to think about in this broader context if we're not able at least so far to demonstrate a decrease in length of stay or a decrease in postmenstrual age at full oral feedings that that tells us that there is certainly a maturational component that said know and have been talking about the fact that experiences do matter and so when we step back and think about what our role is in the intensive care nursery we also need to acknowledge that we have these primitive reflexes that support early feedings and for instance the central pattern generator is a major driving force but these components are integrated and really feeding becomes a learned skill beginning probably by at least four months and the Torilla article that I've mentioned before suggests that it may happen as early as two months post uh, excuse me uh, corrected age we know that medically fragile infants are the most at risk for feeding problems and so preterm infants who also have medical instability really um, those two combined to increase the likelihood that infants may be having aversive feeding experiences and all experiences build brain pathways and so our goal then becomes to build brain pathways to support eating over time. We know that the brain is dynamic and it changes constantly and it undergoes continuous modification in response to useful and repetitive stimuli. This is really the basis for most of what we do as therapists in the intensive care nursery. The goal being to repeatedly practice appropriate motor movements in the context of uh, stability in the other areas and that then leads to the maturation of uh, brain processes that support feeding long term. So let's spend a, just a few minutes thinking about infant development and how the experiences that we provide are directly building brain pathways and I want to um, go back in time, if you will, to part two where we introduce this concept with Dr. Heidelie Zalz's work in the intensive care nursery. So Dr. Jane Sweeney in 2010 headed an effort by the American Physical Therapy Association to update the NICU practice guidelines and I encourage all of us to take a look at how they've conceptualized the role of a neonatal practitioner. I think their focus on supporting optimal development is really one that we can all embrace. Within their practice guidelines, they frame the practice guidelines within the dynamic systems theories. Now while I'm going to be focusing on the APTA guidelines, I can assure all of us that the AOTA and the American Speech and Hearing Association all have acknowledged and, and have various um, theories that are similar. They're all dynamic systems theories. So dynamic systems when it comes to infant development really helps us to think about the fact that system components interact with each other and influence neonatal functional performance, which means that nothing is happening in a vacuum, that the infant is not just a lung or just a mouth, that they have an interactive system both within themselves but also we need to recognize that those components are also interacting with physical and social cultural environments as pointed out in the APTA guidelines. So when we think about our role as neonatal practitioners, really when we we can break this down into looking at three interactive parts, the readiness of the infant or the biological, the experiences that the infant is receiving, which is a physical, and then today we're really going to spend more time talking about the social cultural uh, components, really that the infant is a integral part of a family and as such we really need to think about providing support to the infant as well as the family. So let's start with this idea of readiness. How do we know that an infant is ready from an infant developmental standpoint? And 
I look to Dr. Alls's work um, all the way back in 1982. It's the basis for the NIDCAP program, the Newborn Individualized Developmental Care and Assessment Program. Um, and so her theory is the Synactive Organization of Behavioral Development. And in this theory, she talks about that by a behavioral organization, is an ongoing process and that there are systems or subsystems that we can look at that tell us how the infant is processing information and those systems interact and they are interdependent and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes in a little more detail. Behavioral organization within the infant supports the infant's ability and desire, I would say, to respond to challenges that are presented when they are born preterm. And that those of us who are interacting with the infant can both observe and respond to the infant's behavior with the goal of supporting regulation of the infant and that in turn supports the infant's ability to focus on new tasks. So physiologic stability is a foundation system within this uh, synactive organization and supports the organization of all of the other systems. So the other systems that we can look at to determine how the infant is um, tolerating our interactions include the movement system, behavioral state or uh, level of alertness or arousal, their ability to attend and interact to the information that's being provided and their ability to self-regulate. So those are the five foundation components within the synactive theory. And this is the theory itself. Uh, Dr. Alls has graciously given me permission to use this when I teach. So what I want to point out is that there is this interaction. And so for instance, for all of our infants who have autonomic challenges, infants with respiratory um, comorbidities or with cardiac issues, neurologic issues, their autonomic system is compromised and within that compromise we also see that their motor system typically is not developing on par with a healthy infant. Their ability to be calm and interactive um, is also oftentimes uh, negatively influenced. So there is that component, but the other piece of the synactive theory is this idea of synaction and interdependence. And specific to feeding, what that means is that we can look at each of these systems, so the autonomic system, how the heart rate, um, how stable is the heart rate, how stable is the oxygenation, the respiratory system, the visceral system, those are components with the, within the autonomic system. And with feeding, which is an extra challenge, we often see a slight disruption in the autonomic system because we're providing a challenge. The key is to recognize how much of a disruption is acceptable because when we're learning something new, we often are needing to have a bit of a disruption. But how much is how much of a disruption would be telling us that the task at hand is overwhelming the infant. So for instance, if an infant is going bradycardic when they're eating or they are dropping their saturations when they're eating, those are specific communication uh, avenues for us as providers. The motor system is similar. Um, specific to feeding, we often see as an infant be becomes less organized, that they may lose some of the flexion that they begin a feeding with across their shoulders or across their um, arms, their upper extremities. Their face may become lax and that is a communication that the feeding in and of itself is challenging and perhaps is, is more challenging than beneficial. Behavioral state, infants may shut down, they may try to close out the feeding experience if the experience is overwhelming them and that also obviously affects their attention and interaction. So there's a synaction, there is 
often a talking across the system. So for instance, if the autonomic system begins to be challenged and the infant starts to have some respiratory uh, increased work of breathing, as an example, you may see a, a cascade effect where then the motor system starts to show distress, then the state system shows distress. The other piece of the synactive theory, however, is that you can also intervene in one area to support organization in all of the areas. And so, for instance, with feeding, if you support the motor abilities by swaddling an infant, you may see that actually the infant's autonomic system is more stable, the behavioral state system is more stable. So it is both a communication of stability and instability, but it also is a feedback system to practitioners in terms of the success of the interventions that they might be providing. So this interaction um, component really is focused on organization. We expect that infants will have some slight disorganization as they reach new levels of sophistication in terms of their functioning. But organization and disorganization of one often influences the other systems. We're looking to provide the challenge of feeding within a level of organization so that the infant can solidify those skills and then build upon them. That's really the idea behind the synactive theory. And that helps us to think about readiness and the response of the infant when we provide experiences. When we look at experiences, I think this is my favorite quote of all time. And the quote comes from, as you can see, uh, BC time. Practice is everything. This is often misquoted as practice makes perfect. So one of the things that parents are looking for, one of the things that practitioners are working for, physicians and medical colleagues are looking for, is that the infant is practicing that with practice, the idea is that they are going to get better, that each time they're practicing, they're going to be improving. So I want us to step back and think about this slightly differently. I agree that practice is everything, but practicing the wrong kinds of skills will lead to perfecting the wrong kinds of skills. That at least has been my experience with infants. So we really need to be mindful of the experiences that the infant has and to the best of our ability, make sure that the infant is repeatedly practicing the kinds of feeding skills that we want them to develop. So eating comfortably, eating with good skill, eating with enough energy that they feel confident and competent when they're done with the feeding. So in the APTA, they have looked to the theory of neuronal group selection, which was proposed by Edelman in 1987. And this is very similar to the quote, use it or lose it um, uh, concept that we've talked about before that actually has multiple iterations. I would say Daniel Siegel's work is one that I look to when I think about the concept that's more of the use it or lose it concept. And that idea is that the more a brain pathway is stimulated, the, the stronger that brain pathway gets. And certainly that is a component of the theory of neuronal group selection. We know that the brain is a selective system and it's strongly influenced by the experiences that are provided both internal and external um, to the infant. And I bring that up because the experience of internal discomfort during feeding certainly is also part of an experience that many of our infants have. So it's not just the external experiences that we need to consider. We know that the brain changes in response to these signals. So in the theory of neuronal group selection, they talk about the experiential selection component. And this is this idea that synaptic connections are strengthened through repetitive activation 
or weakened through disuse. And that is a foundational concept that we have when it comes to early intervention. What I think is wonderful about the theory of neuronal group selection is this idea of re-entrant mapping and global neural maps. So basically, the, this concept takes the brain pathway concept and elevates it to a new level. We need to think about eating as a global map. And global maps are created that involve motor and sensory systems. And the, the brain pathway is not a single pathway. The brain pathway becomes a neural map. So let's make this a little easier to understand. A brain pathway for eating, infant eating, may include the brain pathway of suction. And we've talked about the role of suction. So the component of using negative pressure to draw fluid in, that is a brain pathway. But eating is more than that. Eating is the motor movements of suction and swallowing and fluid bolus handling. It also is the sensory integration component. So it is sucking and swallowing and breathing while tasting, while having the touch of breast or bottle within the mouth, while being held, while listening and being influenced by what the infant sees, smells, touches. And so the idea behind the theory of neuronal group selection is it takes the concept of a single brain pathway and helps us to consider that the eating experience is much more complex. And that is likely one of the reasons why motor-based programs that address only one component, so touch as an example, or suction as an example, may not be getting us to where we're looking to be, which is supporting infant eating. And hopefully that, that concept is, um, is somewhat clear. For those of us who work in early intervention or those of us who work with uh, infants who really have long-term feeding issues, I would say this, when I read this component um, piece, I thought about the many infants that I've seen over the years that will suck on a pacifier but won't eat anything. That when they're offered anything um, that has taste, anything that that moves freely in their mouth, that they show aversive behaviors. And so the concept then became much more real to me, that the brain pathway for sucking was present, but the global neural map for eating was not. So all experiences that the ha infant has matters, and we really need to think about the pathways that infants are building and making sure that we're creating the ones that we want the infant to maintain. So is there attention when we are interacting with infants? Are we attending to their stability? Are we looking at the infant's communication to us that the experience is a positive experience, that it's something that they're enjoying? Or instead, are we trying to give experiences to infants to build a specific brain pathway and not really recognizing that the infant may be experiencing a very aversive time with us. So we need to think about the cumulative learned experiences of infants and each of us think about what our infants are experiencing within our own nursery. So this third part to this series, I want to bring us back to the concept of nourishing that we're really trying to foster the development of during a period of training. And our focus for this three-part series is really on feeding itself. So 
I've put together some compare and contrast ideas, if you will, of what feeding means to me and hopefully what feeding means to a lot of us. That feeding is something that parents do with their infants. Feeding is a a loving relationship. There is much more within a parent-child feeding context than just get the volume in. And if we recall this video from early on in part one, actually, I'm going to fast forward here to the middle and start it. And I want to uh, reassure everyone when the video is being played through the webinar, it's going to be coming through probably in slow motion time. But what I want us to just be thinking about is not the specifics of the video, but thinking about is this our concept of nourishing? Is this our concept of a parent-child interaction that's building a love for learning, a love for eating, a love for feeding our own children? Is that what we're seeing when we're watching this kind of a video? As well, meaning as the thought behind providing the taste of lemon to this infant, is this really building a global neural map for wanting to keep eating and learning about eating throughout the first several years of life? Are we promoting the parent interaction that shows this very visible love relationship? Are infants interactive during feedings? Are they in this behavioral state where they're in awe of their mother while they're breastfeeding? Or are they being fed in situations like this without human contact, without being held, without that support that we're looking for when when we think about nourishing, this is feeding, perhaps, but is it nourishing? Are we looking at infants who, despite their medical comorbidities, are being supported to learn about eating and all of the sensory and oral motor components of eating that are going to support feeding long term? Are we encouraging the parent to be the primary feeder? Or are we thinking about feeding from the perspective that feeding starts as soon as the infant is being fed? In this video, this infant apparently was on nasal CPAP prior to being taken out of the isolate. The mother is sitting, waiting for the baby to come to her lap for a very first feeding. But you need to think about that the infant is experiencing a feeding already. What is this baby experiencing? Is this that loving relationship that we've been looking for and that we think about when we think about feeding babies? The feeding begins well before the infant is offered a breast or a bottle. This infant, through her behaviors, her motor movements, is showing that this is a stressful event. And in fact, in the video, goes on to have a desaturation episode. So, We've been talking about interventions and a number of different kinds of interventions. We've been talking about readiness and we've talked a lot about experiences. But I really wanted to wrap up this three-part series by coming back to the sociocultural. That really feeding is a putting together an infant-mother relationship, putting into practice a love relationship between two human beings. It's really something that's quite unique within a parent-child interaction. It supports the infant's development, but it also supports the parent 
understanding and development of themselves. They frequently evaluate their premature infant's health and their own competency as parents by the infant's feeding success and by weight gain. We know that the baby's ability to eat and a mother's ability to feed her own baby are at the heart of who she is as a mother. And it's very powerful to stop and consider the fact that the majority of time together in the first year is actually spent feeding. And it's a very powerful social and emotional learning experience. And when it's positive, the parent and the child develop a synchrony. And for those of us who work with infants post-discharge, we also see that when feeding is stressful for either the parent or the child, that over time they can develop a dis the parent-child relationship can be negatively influenced. Catherine Shaker, way back in 1999, talked about the importance of including parents in education, including parents as primary feeders, and really recognizing that confidence for the parent comes from having the information necessary to both assess the infant during feedings and to intervene to minimize problems. So parents really need to become expert feeders, but that really should not be our end goal. I always try to step back and remind both the parent and professional caregivers that I work with that our end goal should be that an infant is an expert eater. That while in the beginning the infant is a novice and the expertise of the feeder really does contribute a significant amount to that infant's experience, that over time our goal should be to help the infant develop autonomously, if you will, the ability to eat from a breast or a bottle without all of the extra interventions, if at all possible. And that then tells us that the infant has developed really a solid basis for feeding that then hopefully will support their continued learning. We know that when you look at parental responses during feedings that their success really does make a big difference. In this study of 33 moms, the mothers were interviewed uh, following birth about their desire to breastfeed and what it felt like to them that their infant who was born preterm wasn't able to breastfeed right away. And you see that they are having feelings of sorrow and guilt, disappointment, frustration, insecurity, and oftentimes are having fear of touching, holding, or harming the babies when they are attempting to breastfeed. But look at how the maternal understanding of self and expression of feelings change. When their infant is successful at breastfeeding, the mothers are able to describe feelings of fulfillment and pride and satisfaction. Certainly, when I think about my three wonderful children, I look back at the times that I breastfed them or bottle fed them and those were very unique wonderful memories for me and I'm hoping that the mothers that I work with will be able to look back at similar experiences. Uh, Silberstein in 2009 looked at the parent-child interaction during feedings for infants uh, in Israel, there were 97 parent-child dyads, and what she was finding was that the, there was increased maternal intrusiveness that was related to lower feeding robustness and lower suck and milk transfer rates. What that basically means is that infants who were not as alert, not as robust during feedings and were not really taking a lot of good volume, the child's behavior led to the parent becoming more intrusive in their attempt to try and facilitate greater 
um, sucking, longer sucking uh, moments, if you will. And so less intact neurobehavioral functioning in the neonatal period was also related to less optimal early maternal infant feeding interactions. And so the parents that we're working with certainly are at risk for struggling to see themselves as competent parents. And it really becomes part of our job, I believe, to not only work with the infant, but also to work with the parent in understanding what their child's behaviors are telling them and how to respond. And there are a number of feeding programs that include parental education and we've spoken um, at least to some extent about all of them. Uh, Suzanne Thorey's co-regulation program, certainly what she's published has been primarily around staff uh, interactions during feedings, but I know that I have heard her speak at national conferences about using a similar program to guide parents in understanding their infant's behaviors, their infant uh, capabilities, and understanding whether or not their interventions are successful. Karen Pridham's work um, around guided participation has been used by a number of different people. Uh, Karen Pridham, Suzanne Thorey, um, uh, uh, Lisa Brown, um, Rain, Rainer. So a number of people are using this, this component. Basically in guided participation what the professional is doing is reviewing videos with parents and helping them to really identify what they thought was going on during that time period of the video and then helping them to think about the infant's responses. The H program, uh, sorry, the H Hope program uh, that White Trout has been publishing we did briefly talk about in part one and then the Sophie program that I've developed really is designed to step parents through a decision-making process as well. Feeding is a major developmental task and one that parents are actively teaching their infants and children learn in the context of these important relationships. And we as the professional caregivers are part of that family for a very short period of time. Really the child is going to continue to learn within the relationship with their parents. And so I'm going to ask all of us to sit back for a minute and reflect. Reflect upon our own practices. Are we supporting parental choices? Are we collaborating with parents? Do we ask about breastfeeding wishes and desires? And what do we do and what do we say when a mother says she wants to breastfeed? What if she says that her desire is to exclusively breastfeed? How does the unit respond? How do we respond? Do we become an advocate for what she is desiring and what she's expressing? How do we respond when people comment that breastfeeding are might delay discharge in face of the evidence that suggests that that is not necessarily the case. Are we educating people within our own unit? Are we supporting the parent and recognizing that those messages, whether said or unsaid, put the parent into a predicament? what the parent would like to do might be to exclusively breastfeed. And yet if the message is that exclusively breastfeeding might delay the infant's discharge, the parent then is forced to make a choice. In reality, based upon the evidence, that might be a misconception. Are we supporting parents to be the primary feeders? Are parents feeding their infant their first bottle? In many settings, the practitioners are feeding the infant their first bottle while the parent may or may not even be present. Are we working through the parents and in partnership with the parents? 
what are the behaviors that are modeled for parents in our unit. For instance, we often discuss that parents need support in interpreting their infant behaviors. However, the parent often gets mixed messages. As one example, many times an infant might begin to show signs of fatigue and a staff member may be recommending and modeling that the parent continue to feed through those signs of uh, a desire to stop on the part of the infant. And yet someone else in the unit might blame the parent for, quote, pushing the infant when the infant is tired. We need to recognize that parents watch what we do in addition to listening to what we say. So when we start thinking about shifting the focus from a motor-based focus where we're really thinking about a single brain pathway and moving more into this holistic conceptualization of global neural maps, one of the major factors that we need to remember is that infant feeding begins with more reflexive motor patterns and these integrate beginning probably at least by four months, and according to the Tirola article that I referenced in part one, it might be as early as two months corrected age. And so the development of these more global pathways may not be immediately evident in the NICU. Infants may in fact discharge from the NICU, quote, eating well enough, quote, and yet be showing more subtle signs that eating is in fact too taxing or difficult for them, period. The later feeding rejections or feeding aversions that are fairly prevalent in this population might in fact be related to the experiences that the infant has while in the intensive care nursery. So when we use theories of infant development, we can begin to develop interventions and build global neural networks that support feeding not only within the intensive care nursery, but also post-discharge. So that leads to one other concept that I want to come or bring into the equation. And this is actually the classical conditioning learning theory that Pavlov brought up in 1927. And certainly in his experiments, he was looking at dog and dog behavior. So bear with me because then we're going to discuss how this, in fact, is quite evident in infant feeding and feeding behaviors over time post discharge. So in the classical conditioning experiment that Pavlov conducted, he recognized that there are things that happen in the environment such as food being present, so food powder in his experiment. And those stimuli in the environment that are present can lead to what are called unconditioned responses, which are body-based responses. They are not learned. They do not have to be learned. They're an automatic body response in the face of certain stimuli. And so for dogs, when they see food, the unconditioned stimulus, their natural response is to begin salivating. The conditioned stimulus is something neutral in the environment that is not generally associated to the unconditioned stimulus. So in this case, it was a bell. And so every time he showed the dog food, he also rang the bell in the hopes of building a brain pathway from food powder to the bell and from listening to the bell directly to salivating. And so that is the conditioned stimulus that results in what's called a conditioned response. The bell, the sound of the bell, then will create salivating in the dog. And with functional MRI studies, we're now actually able to see direct brain pathway connections between auditory areas and the salivation areas within animal models.
So how does this relate to feeding and what happens over time? The concern that we all need to step back and, and have on our radar screens is that there are a number of unconditioned stimuli that are present in this population. So for instance, many of the infants that we're working with experience nausea. Through uncomfortable feedings, through feedings where infants are not being observed carefully and their behaviors are not being respected, infants may be actually experiencing pain or discomfort during feeding. Certainly there is ample evidence that infants may be desaturating during feedings, having bradycardic episodes during feeding, choking during feedings, or gulping and feeling out of control. So those are would all be considered unconditioned stimuli in the environment. There are body-based responses to each of those. The body-based response to nausea, the unconditioned response, is to suppress the appetite. The unconditioned response to the body experiencing pain or discomfort is often withdraw or escape. And I would say that we see a similar behavior when the unconditioned stimuli is desaturating or choking or bradycardic episodes that over time I will occasionally see an infant who will suck on a pacifier but as soon as you try to offer them a bottle or a breast, they'll withdraw and escape. They'll start to cry, they'll fuss, they'll turn their head. So those are your unconditioned stimuli and unconditioned responses. And the concern, obviously, is that the conditioned stimuli in the environment actually might be the presentation of food, whereby over time, if food is repeatedly offered and nausea is present, or pain and discomfort is present during the meal time, or other unpleasant events like desaturations, choking, gulping, or bradycardic episodes are present, you actually run the risk of building a brain pathway between food and the nausea, pain, discomfort, desaturating, choking stimuli, as well as between food and the conditioned response of appetite suppression and withdraw and escape. And so those of us who work with infants over time have certainly experienced periods where an infant might be happy and, and maybe even babbling to the parent and the parent tries to put that infant into a breast or bottle feeding position and the infant changes and becomes very fussy, is arching and trying to get out of that, that feeding position. That would be an example of a strong conditioned response of withdrawal and escape in response to the conditioned stimuli of being put into a breast or bottle feeding position. So all of these details matter that we've been talking about. The, the attention to the infant's behaviors, their subtle or not subtle responses in breathing, in heart rate, in saturation levels, which are communication systems that we can look to, their motor responses of becoming lax orally or losing flexion in their upper extremities as an example, or even shutting down, going to sleep or crying and fussing. These are all communications to us that we really need to pay attention to. The details really matter. And in fact, the details matter prior to offering the breast or bottle feeding. How much energy does the infant expend during the process of being brought from the bed to the parent? In fact, is the parent picking the infant up and nurturing the infant from the moment that they touch the infant. So really what we're trying to do in this three-part webinar is to kind of step back and take a look at the science, what we have, and then to start making informed decisions. First, respecting that all of the research information that we have at our disposal really is important and matters. We learn as much from studies that do not show us what we thought we were going to find as an outcome, as well as those that 
provide what are considered, quote, positive outcomes. So all of the information we've gleaned from studies that really haven't helped us to decrease length of stay or decrease postmenstrual age at which full oral feedings are attained, those studies really help us to build the picture that there is a strong developmental component that we need to look at. We also have information that shows that there are some positive outcomes that can be achieved when we start focusing on more qualitative um, behaviors. We want to consider therapeutic interventions with as much respect and implement them with as much caution as the medical community implements medical interventions. And this is really an area that I want us to stop and consider more intently. What I have certainly thought over the time of my career is that I, because what I do is not invasive, if you will, that perhaps I don't have to be as thoughtful about what I do. And certainly over the years of my career, I've changed that opinion. And in the face of all of the information we've just covered regarding the experiential components, the readiness components, the social cultural components, the influence of all of the experiences, the classical conditioning learning that we've just reviewed. What I need to embrace is that everything that I do does make a difference, whether intended or not. And so I really want us to, to be thoughtful about every time we put our hands near an infant or communicate with a parent or, or offer support that our interventions matter. And so I would like to give a little um, scenario, if you will. I was recently teaching and presenting information on my perspective regarding sickening feeds during uh, preterm feeding specifically. And in my teachings, I was reviewing the different perspectives. So certainly from a perspective of trying to support safe swallowing, thickening might be a viable intervention. However, there is not actually good data to support that intervention in the preterm population. And when you look at other perspectives, specifically GI perspectives and nutrition perspectives, there are some negative ramifications that we at least need to be aware of. And so I was presenting this information and a participant actually brought up her concern that I was basically implying that this is an intervention that we should at best be cautious about and potentially may not even consider in the preterm population. And I basically agreed that that was what I was doing. And her perspective was that there was no study that had directly implicated the newer thickening agents with any death or illness in an infant and therefore they should be considered safe until proven otherwise. Which is a very interesting perspective and one that you certainly wouldn't find within the medical community. So I would caution all of us to take a more cautious stance, if you will, and consider that our interventions may be inadvertently causing negative outcomes as well. And so it just behooves all of us to really know what the evidence is for the various interventions that we're considering. Know when we don't have good evidence for the interventions. I encourage every clinician to participate in research at some level, um, even if it's very small studies and working with your internal um, institutional research review boards if possible. But we also need to always be able to fall back and think about the theoretical foundations of each of our interventional approaches. And so in, in the face of 
emerging data, if you will, at least being able to talk about the theoretical foundations of what we're doing. Because each of us are professionals. We all are really tasked with supporting our teams, supporting our families, and supporting the infants with whom we work. So what is your perspective on infant feeding, and what do you believe? And can you articulate that? Do you believe that all infants in intensive care nursery need therapy interventions, that somehow they are atypical or abnormal because they were born preterm? Do you believe that infants in the intensive care nursery are born at risk because of their prematurity and or their medical comorbidities, but are capable of progressing to eating as long as their behavioral cues are respected and experiences are provided that support positive, enjoyable experiences? And are you then advocating for a focus on positive, enjoyable experiences? Are you collaborating with the other professionals from other disciplines so that there's a coordinated approach and who's setting the plan and are the parents part of the team and are the parents wishes paramount in what the plan says are the professional caregivers in your nursery respecting and following the plan or is there disagreement amongst the professionals and where do the parents fall within that? If the professionals are using the parents to advocate for their own desires. For instance, a parent who is attempting to bottle feed and a nurse says, well, I don't think that that bottle works. I use something else. That then puts the parent in a difficult position. So really pulling all of our team members together and working together to develop plans that are inclusive of the parents' desires and what the parent knows about their infant. So in summary to this part three, the best infant-led feeding approach we know is breastfeeding because the infant really is in complete charge. However, we also know that there are myths about the infant's ability to breastfeed in the intensive care nursery and we really need to understand what those are, understand what the research is that dispels those myths and then educate everyone within that environment. We know that none of the approaches that we've talked about has reliably decreased length of stay nor decreased postmenstrual age of full oral feeding which means that there is likely a very strong maturational component that we need to be respectful of. We know that the influence of the development of the infant, the experiences of the infant, and the role of the feeder are only recently being studied in a more holistic way. And that developmentally supportive, infant-led, parent-inclusive approaches to establishing quality infant feeding skills in the intensive care setting are needed, as are studies that facilitate our understanding and supportive practices to support feeding skill abilities post discharge. And so we really want to wrap up this three-part series by considering feeding as a nourish, nourishing act, not just a provision of food, and recognizing that the fun of feeding will help to build a strong foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for this very informative and inspirational uh, discussion. We do have some questions now that I'd like to um, ask. Um, question number one. In our NICU, the issue with infant-led feedings, although the concept is embraced, is a staffing issue, i.e. having enough staff caregivers respond to multiple infants' feeding cues at the infant's pace. The argument is that a nurse with a, ba with a four baby assignment, which is the norm, is not able to support infant feeding needs. Can you offer suggestions for implementing infant-led feeding in the NICU when RNs and management is used, used to a scheduled Q3 hour feeding model? Uh, sure, this is certainly a um, problem that we all are facing. And uh, the first thing that I would do is encourage you to pull the pocket reference that I had in uh, part two, and it is in your reference list, because they actually looked at the nurse-patient ratio 
in a true ad lib model. And they didn't find that there was any difference in the nurse patient ratio when infants were allowed to truly be fed on an ad lib schedule. But that said, there's only the one that really has given us that information specific to nurse patient ratio. The other thing that I would encourage all of us to do, and certainly again, it's it's certainly not easy, um, is to put a lot of our effort up front on encouraging parents to be present as much as possible. I think um, you know, when the parent feels like they don't have the expertise to best feed their baby, they may not understand how critical it is for them to be present. And when you're able to have them present in the NICU, then supporting them to feel competent and comfortable in providing care to the infant allows them to be the primary feeder. And that then allows the nurse to basically have a a buddy, if you will. The parent should be the primary feeder and that allows a nurse who has a four baby assignment to be more of a coach for the parents that are present. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I'm I'm told that I'm too optimistic, but I can tell you that in working very closely with social work, we've been able to overcome some pretty amazing obstacles to parents being available to their infants in the intensive care nursery. And so thinking that it is possible helps to to find creative ways to make it possible. Second question. You mentioned a self-paced bottle in a number of studies. Can you provide examples of a self-paced bottle? Um, sure. The self-paced bottle uh, that was used in the research setting was used by Lau, Chantal Lau and colleagues, and there are several references um, that describe that bottle that are in your reference list. I don't actually know if the research bottle model is commercially available or if she's worked with a bottle company and so you can certainly contact her to find that information. However, what I can tell you is that the self-paced bottle is a vacuum-free bottle that is designed to allow the infant more control over the flow and certainly the Dr. Brown's bottle system is also a vacuum-free bottle. So I would consider that a self-paced bottle. There are other bottles that are designed to provide a vacuum-free environment, such as the Playtex Vintair or other drop-in bottles that are not hard-sided. Remember that air must exchange with fluid in a hard-sided system or else you get a vacuum effect and that really is the um, the the goal of the Dr. Brown's bottle system is that there is that free air exchange. Um, and in a typical bottle system, that air exchange is quite variable. It's difficult to control for. So um, it is, it's a good idea to be using a self-paced system if at all possible. You can also look at uh, three different references, um, and I'm just going to tell you what they are. Uh, Kelly Jackman has an article called Go With the Flow, Choosing a Feeding System for Infants in the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit and Beyond based on flow performance and that was in newborn and infant nursing reviews in 2013. Um, Britt Pados and colleagues have more recently published in the American Journal of Speech Language Pathology uh, an article in 2015 called Milk Flow Rates from Bottle Nipples Used for Feeding Hospitalized Infants. And then I also published with my colleague Lauren Furman in Perspectives in Swallowing and Swallowing Disorders in 2015 an article entitled Supporting Oral Feeding Skills Through Bottle Selection. So all three of those options will give you some further information on the importance of a vacuum-free system. The question, these questions are based on the following observation that you discussed in the webinar sessions. When nurses and other professionals are specifically trained in infant-led feedings, premature infants move more rapidly and more comfortably toward full oral feedings. Have parents been systemically trained in the NICU to read and respond to their infant's feeding cues so that they can continue to implement this style of responsive feeding when the baby is discharged from the hospital? 
And if so, are there any studies that have filmed at home meal, meals and looked at how successfully parents are able to implement this type of communication based program at home? Um, wow, that's a great question. So the first thing that I wanted to point out is that the information that we have around infant-led feedings have been focused on nurses and other professionals who were feeding infants, but remember that we're not actually the main feeders, or we shouldn't be, and over time we certainly are not. Um, we know that the parent by far is going to be feeding their infant more than we will over that first several years. So we know that guiding a parent who's feeding their infant is actually very different than a parent watching a professional feeder, and I want to remind all of us that, that we want to keep our on supporting that parent as the primary feeder. Um, so that said, to my knowledge, we don't yet have the information about parents being systematically trained in the intensive care nurse feeder read and respond to their infant's cues. I know of several research studies in process that are actually looking at this very thing. So the closest that I can give you in response to this is to encourage you to pull the very large body of work actually by Karen Pridham, P-R-I-D-H-A-M, and her colleagues, um, and there are a number of them that I've already mentioned, which really has been focused on what's called guided participation. So it's really teaching parents to observe and respond to infant cues through coaching. But her work has been more focused on the post-discharge time frame. Um, and and there is some in the intensive care nursery time frame, but to my knowledge, we haven't yet really looked at a um, at teaching a parent in the intensive care nursery and then following them into the home to see if they're continuing to use those behaviors. Um, so that that would be the answer to that. That that I think is the next step. We really need to be looking at that. What do we know about their ability to generalize the, patient, the parent's recognition and responsiveness to an infant-led feeding style as the infant matures and, as, and is introduced to new foods with different complexities? For instance, pureed, texture foods, and maybe table food. That's a wonderful uh, area of study, and actually the nutrition science are where you're going to find the answer to those questions. Um, there's been a lot of attention on the different styles that parents bring to feeding if the parent uh, was breastfeeding their baby or formula feeding their baby. And actually now there's even some that look at breast milk being offered in a bottle. So what they're finding is that that uh, parents who breastfeed, remember that is the ultimate infant-led feeding. Um, parents don't know how much the infant is taking. They learn to respond to the infant's cues of hunger and satiety. And so um, that's why they're looking at breastfed infants compared to either formula-fed or bottle-fed breast milk fed babies. And so um, what they're finding is that that uh, it's called maternal control of feeding. And so when the infant is breastfeeding, that's considered child control because the parent really has no idea of how much the infant is taking. When a parent is using a bottle, what we find is that they become volume focused and so that's considered maternal control. And that same behavior actually does follow the child as they transition to purees and textured foods. And so mothers of babies who were breastfed, those mothers are much more likely to allow the infant to be more exploratory during the transition to complementary foods and to eat only what they want and to be done when they say they're done. In contrast, parents who 
either formula feed their babies or give the babies breast milk in a bottle, because they've become volume focused with bottle feeding, they actually bring that same focus. So they're more intrusive, they're more pressuring, and they're really much more likely to be focused on the infant finishing the jar of baby food or finishing the volume that they gave them. Um, so they override those child's satiety cues and that is a significant risk factor for um, leading to overweight and obesity in in the early childhood years. So that's why the nutrition sciences are really where you would go for that information. So I've pulled just a couple of references. Um, there's one by Brown and Raynor in the Journal of Human Nutrition and Dietetics in April of 2011 that's entitled Maternal Control of Child Feeding During Breast and Formula Feeding in the First Six Months Postpartum. Uh, Blissett, B-L-I-S-S-E-T-T, -T, and Faro, F as in Frank, A-R-R-O-W, have put out a couple of different ones. Um, one is called Predictors of Maternal Control of Feeding at One and Two Years of Age, and that is found in the International Journal of Obesity in October of 2007. And then there's another one entitled Breastfeeding, Maternal Feeding Practices, and Mealtime Negativity at One Year. And that's in the Journal of Appetite in January of 2006. Now, none of those three references were specific to intensive care nursery infants, however. And you may have answered some of this question uh, already, Dr. Ross. When a parent learns to respond to and respect infant feeding cues in the NICU, is there any relationship to the development of feeding challenges later? Um, we don't. We don't have the answer to that question. We do know that uh, data show that parents of infants coming out of the intensive care nursery do have more mealtime struggles in general. And I did uh, reference a review article that I co-authored with Dr. Joy Brown called Feeding Outcomes in Preterm Infants After Discharge from the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. That's in your reference list. Um, and, and that is a review of what parents are telling us in terms of the outcomes. What I can tell you is that we don't really have any information that I know of yet that shows that if we intervene with the parent and teach them to respond to and respect the infant feeding cues in the NICU that we can change that outcome. And really I think that is the next, the next step. And our last question here, are there any studies comparing parent feeding styles after NICU discharge and how parents respond or not to their baby's feeding communication cues in later infancy and during the toddler period? Um, again, not specific to the intensive care nursery. I do want to point out though, and I don't know if uh, the wording of this was specific, but there is something in the field of nutrition called parenting styles, and um, there is some data to suggest that there are specific parenting behaviors that are related to either um, and, well, actually, it's more related to overweight status. But what I do want to point out is that um, more recent research is kind of dismissing this idea of parenting styles. So uh, instead, think of parenting behaviors, because one of the things that more recent research is showing is that we actually uh, have different quote-unquote styles throughout the day. <laughs> so for instance, um, parent, parenting styles include permissive, so eat whatever you want, um, or what's called authoritarian, which is very directive, um, you know, you need to sit and you need to finish all your vegetables would be an example. And what we now know, being a little more sophisticated in how we're looking at this, is that the same parent with the same child may actually be be more permissive at certain times of the day than others. So um, I always equate that to if I've had a bad day at work and I come home, I'm much less um, likely to argue with my child about 
what we're having for dinner and more likely to give in. <laughs> so that's not really considered a style anymore, that's more considered a behavior. So um, so I, that's not exactly the answer to that question because uh, the question was more related to the NICU and we do not have that information. But there is information about parenting styles and, and later development. It's just, I just wanted to caution that that um, that belief system, I believe, is changing somewhat as we're becoming more sophisticated at looking how parents uh, try to support their children in early feeding practices. Well, that ends our Q&A um, session. Thank you again, Dr. Ross, for uh, very insightful, informative uh, presentations. Thank you all. Thank you.